Um, hi everyone. So yes, I'm Emma. Um, I'm a psychotherapist for Mersey Care. Um, so I've come to you, um, come here today just to speak about a little bit about self harm, um, and also about some of the work that we've been doing um, in Mersey Care over the past four years. Um, the Hope Therapy Project, well, the Hope Therapy Service. Um, so yeah, the the Hope. So it stands for Hospital Outpatient Psychotherapy Engagement. Um, and it's a, a service that we set up in, in A&E for, for people that attend with self-harm or overdose um, to offer rapid access to therapy. So that's what I'm here to talk about today and, and bits about, about myths about self-harm also. There we go. Yeah, so yeah, just what I've just said about how a bit of the agenda of um, the rationale for, for why we set it up. Um, what our referral pathway is, a um, little bit of a, of a case summary and some, some patient feedback and then some, um, some myths about self-harm. So yeah, so just the, obviously the, the definition of, of, of what self-harm is and, and, and really what, what we class self-harm as in, in A&E. So self-injury, self-poisoning or, or what we sometimes see, well, a lot of the time, um, both. So yes, yeah, so what what we were noticing with the A and E liaison team is um, the 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 people that the practitioners would would go and assess would largely be coming in with self harm and and suicidal thoughts um, or suicide attempts. So we can just kind of see a list of of what we noticed that people were were attending A and E, um, the kind of the kind of um, problems that we were seeing. So as you can see, and like what a lot of people have said today, um, self-harm and, and suicidal thoughts were, were really common. So, yeah, so as and similar to, to like what a lot of people have, have said today, um, the, 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 obviously we know that self-harm um, and repeated self-harm can predict a suicide attempt um, well up, way above any other um, kind of symptoms or, or diagnosis. Um, and the hospitals actually managed 200,000 episodes of self-harm a year. Um, that was in 2011. I imagine that that may have gone up since then. Um, and also, similarly to, to what lots of people have also said before, the risk of suicide in the first year following the initial self-harm presentation is 49 times greater um, than, than the general population. So, like what we've seen, repeated self-harm is a massive indicator for for a suicide attempt and, and completed suicide. So also what we were noticing as well is that obviously, like what we said, lot, that a huge amount of people who the, the practitioners were assessing would engage in, in self-harm, suicide attempts. But what we would also notice is the same people would be assessed. They'd be sent back on their way, but then they'd reattend in a month, two months, three months. And we were just kind of wondering what, what's actually happening a lot of people were just sent back to their GP. Obviously, G GPs are very limited in the time that they can give people. Um, so then sometimes they'd be referred to IAPT, but then, like, like lots of people I'm sure are aware, they might be told that if they're self-harming or if they're still self-harming during therapy, they might be too, too complex for, for therapy. So there was kind of, there, was, there wasn't really anything in the middle so, so the, it was done initially as a pilot study at the Royal to um, just to try and offer therapy to people within the first two weeks of them attending A and E with self harm, and the idea was that that kind of the rapid access. So, contacting people within two days and seeing people within two weeks for a first therapy session, um, and then that would be four sessions of therapy, follow a four week gap, and then a follow up session. So this is just kind of um, the the referral pathway that we had. So people would would attend A and E, be seen often medically, then referred to the mental health liaison team. They would do the the um, the assessment, and then if the the person who'd attended had self harmed or attempted overdose, we changed it to within the last six to twelve months because we didn't kind of want it to be oh if if you'd self harmed you'd get therapy within two weeks, but because you haven't. So we sit, we we broadened it to about within the last 12 months. Then a referral will be made to myself. 
um, I would screen the referral. There, there wasn't really a lot of people who, who didn't get accepted because the liaison team were great in identifying who, who would be suitable. Um, they'd be contacted within two days and seen, as I say, within, within two weeks for their first therapy session. And then, yeah, the follow-up session afterwards. So, yeah, so the therapeutic model that, that I did, so it was um, psychodynamic interpersonal therapy mixed with CAT, because um, I'm a, a CAT therapist. Um, so, yeah, so we, patients would come in, with the, the majority of the session would be brief psychodynamic work, but everybody that engaged would get a, what we call a, a CAT map. So kind of a map of their problems, of what, what their core painful feelings are, where we think they came from. So that's where the psychodynamic work would come in. Um, what, what kinds of things happened just before self-harm. Um, and obviously the, the, we would never kind of say that people have to want to stop self-harming. That was never um, like a, a condition of people being accepted. And often people would self-harm in between sessions and that was spoken about and, um, and worked with in, in the therapy. Um, so yes, yeah, so I delivered my first set therapy session in May 2018 and up to now, so it's, I suppose, more than that from March, I think over 350 patients kind of came through, had their introductory session, four sessions and then follow up. And what we noticed is before the HOPE service, there was about a 30 percent, um, 30 to 40 percent reattendance with A&E after first presentation with self-harm. And then when we, we look back at the figure, it's gone down to less than 10 percent. Um, and, and as Leza said, patients were referred back to the GP, sometimes PASA, which is an organisation we have in Liverpool for, for rape and sexual assault, but never really escalated to CMHTs or other therapies. It wasn't kind of a, this is a, a quick therapy before the real therapy starts or anything. This, this was the intervention in itself. And that's just kind of a, an idea of, of a lady that I worked with. So she was admitted with an overdose um, late June, seen and assessed by the liaison team, referred to myself, first session of therapy. So four days after she took her overdose, um, clinically significant improvement, and then she, she went back to work. So I think what we're kind of, I suppose, demonstrating with this is that a lot of the time there's a myth that if people are self-harming or they're in a crisis, therapy won't work or we can't do therapy. But what, what we've seen at the Hope Therapy Service is that that wasn't true. And then this is just some um, feedback that we got from from patients where they were they were really shocked that that one of the biggest things is that um I, th I think when people were told by liaison you'll be seen within a couple of weeks for your first session i think people were a bit they didn't fully believe it um but then when it happened they they were quite shocked um so yeah and i think it, it was that it was the, the the rapidness of it really of that being contacted quickly while the crisis was often still happening and also having their first session when the crisis was was still ongoing also um was was really beneficial and yeah just um so i was asked as well just to mention a few a few myths about self harm and so so before working in the hope therapy service i used to work in a, a severe um a personality disorder unit down south and um, so i've always kind of worked with with self-harm and um, crisis and risky behaviors so for the past 15 years so i've heard so many myths but these are the ones that kind of stick up the most and um, that like what we've mentioned before similar to suicide that talking about self-harm increases somebody's risk of self-harming um and i think that the figures from hope show that it doesn't and, and even having therapy when somebody self-harming, um, what what we found in our services, it wasn't harmful. Um, it, it it was helpful. Um, it's similar to what we hear quite a lot. People are too complex for therapy, um, attention seeking, or a cry for help. Um, also, as well, we would sometimes get referrals from medical staff in A and E saying we we've got somebody in who's suicidal, but then when we'd actually see the um, the person. They wasn't suicidal at all. They'd self-harmed, 
but they'd never had thoughts to to end their life. And I suppose it's just around the education that maybe people who don't work in in the mental health field and and in the area of self harm, they maybe don't distinguish between the two. And sadly, this is what we've actually witnessed also in A and E. Um, staff saying that withholding empathy and compassion can sometimes deter people from reattending. So if if they're kind and nice and and, and comforting, then worrying that that people will come back. So we've kind of done a lot of education around that probably the opposite would would be true. So yeah, that was just um, I suppose a, a whistle stop tour of the the Hope Therapy Service and and what we did. Um, and also now just thinking about what's what's happening for the future, because the majority of people that, well, I say 50 to 60 percent of the people that I actually seen in Hope, um, there were students from the three universities in Liverpool. So when we collected that data over a couple of years um, and fed that back to both Merseycare and Liverpool University, we've now got something called the UCOPE service, which is university community outpatient psychotherapy so the idea is that people don't have to now attend students don't have to attend a and e to be seen quickly for therapy they can go to their mental health advisors and get sent to um to therapists within the uni and then we've also just finished a project called the copes project which is where gps now if if they have um patients on their caseload who are engaging in self-harm and um, they can also refer to a short course of therapy and, and the idea is it, it's, it's short but it's quick within a couple of weeks of, of being referred um, and then I think in the future as well there's going to be a, a project scope project um, of trying to get this into schools also to offer people um, rapid access to psychotherapy who are who are self-harming but most of the people that I've ever worked with that they've started self-harming at a young age that teenagers occasionally in like 20s and 30s but more often than not um high school level or sometimes younger um so yeah that's that's the work that we're continuing to do um i hope, I hope that was helpful <laughs>